Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Sanders, the Ford School's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's policy talks at the Ford School. Today's event is part of our public policy and institutional discrimination discussion series. Now in its fourth year, this series offers Ford School faculty, staff, students, and others in the university community opportunities to hear from Ford School faculty who discuss important issues of U.S. public policy. This series is designed to foster dialogue that contributes to the deeper understanding of ways in which discrimination manifests itself within institutions. To that end, today's discussion includes a closer look at economic empowerment and racial justice in conversation with Bill Bynum. This event is also part of our Towsley Foundation Lecture Series and features Bill Bynum, who is one of our Towsley Foundation policymakers in residence this year. On behalf of the Ford School, thank you to the Towsley Foundation for their support, and thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Before we get started, a couple of quick notes about format. So we'll have some time toward the end for questions from the audience. We received some questions in advance, but I also encourage you to submit questions or engage in dialogue in the live chat on YouTube or tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. Now I'd like to introduce today's faculty discussant. Bill Bynum began his career, his professional career in North Carolina by helping to establish self-help, a pioneer in the development finance industry. And later he built nationally recognized programs at the North Carolina Rural Economic Development Center. In 1994, he moved to Mississippi to become founding CEO of Enterprise Corporation of the Delta. And in 1995, he organized Hope Community Credit Union. Today, Bill leads the family of Hope organizations, and they include Hope Enterprise Corporation, Hope Credit Union, and Hope Policy Institute. All of these provide financial services. They leverage private and public resources, engage in advocacy, and otherwise act as a catalyst to fulfill its mission of strengthening communities, building assets, and improving lives throughout the Deep South. It also mitigates the extent to which factors such as race, gender, birthplace, and wealth may limit one's ability to prosper. Since 1994, Hope has generated over $3 billion in financing that has benefited more than 2 million people throughout Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee, all while shaping policies and practices that have improved conditions in opportunity-starved communities nationwide. Bill has also served on many boards that include, but are certainly not limited to, the Aspen Institute and the NAACP Legal and Education Defense Fund. He serves as an advisor to Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, and E Pluribus Unum. He's a recipient of the Heinz Award, and he previously chaired the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Consumer Advisory Board, the Treasury Department Community Development Advisory Board, and served as a member of the Biden-Harris Presidential Transition Team. Bill is a Towsley policymaker in residence right here at the University of Michigan at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, he's also an alumnus of the Henry Crown Fellowship, Emerson Collective Dial Fellowship, and Salzburg Global Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Bill Bynum. Stephanie, thank you. It's an honor to be here. And I'm really excited to be a part of the Ford School family. Great. I always find it helpful to start by anchoring my work in the region where we serve. And so please bear with me as I walk through a few slides that hopefully uh, help to accomplish this. What you see before you is a map of um, provided by the Atlantic Magazine that shows where the slave population in the United States was concentrated prior to the Civil War. You can see, as you would expect, much of that is across the South, including the region where I work today, which includes Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. If you fast forward to today and you look at places in the United States where 
poverty is most entrenched and rooted. The U.S. government has a definition of persistent poverty of places, counties where the poverty level has been over 20% for at least three decades in a row. Uh, these are places where poverty has exceeded 20% for a half a century, 50, at least 50 years. And you see significant overlap in the prior map of where slaveholding was concentrated and these maps of where the you have the highest rates of unemployment, the worst education, health, um, outcomes um, where you have highest concentrations of predatory payday lenders and check cashers and subprime lenders, the fewest bank branches, and not coincidentally where you have some of the highest concentrations of people in color. All these conditions that are in the darkest shades on the peripheral maps are places where those outcomes are, are worse than in other parts of this um, all this already significantly under-resourced and underdeveloped um, region. And so what we do at my organization, HOPE, the Family of HOPE organizations, as Stephanie shared, we started as a loan fund back in the mid nineties um, with an objective of improving conditions for in, in the region by providing access to financial services. We wanted to apply a market driven strategy to problem that is persisted in this region for a long time. And so we started by providing financing for uh, entrepreneurs to help them provide good jobs, support good jobs, to pay good wages and offer good benefits. But we soon found that jobs and businesses alone are not enough to support a economy that prospers. Businesses need climates that offer good homes and education so you can attract workers and managers uh, you need health care providers and all the things that people in more affluent, more economically mobile communities take for granted, but were disproportionately not available in the Deep South. And so we started by providing financial services, and that has grown over the years. The slide here shows where we are today. Actually, this was this data is about a year and a half, a couple of years old. It precedes the uh, pandemic, but on a... You know, any course, any day, we may serve households that house up to 100,000 people across the deep south. Almost half of our members didn't have a bank account or were relying on predatory lenders prior to becoming a member of our credit union. Uh, almost 90 percent are people of color. More than half are women. And you can see where you have... Um, again, the highest rates of unbanked and underbanked uh, people in, in our region, and that disproportionately plays out in communities of color. Um, and so we, we served in a very resource and financially underserved region. Um, in addition to just providing access to basic banking services, when you look at the uh, wealth gap in the United States, many of uh, us are familiar with the fact that the gap is 10 to 13 to one black household versus white households um, when you consider what one owns versus what they owe, the wealth, amount of wealth on a family's balance sheet. But that gap rises to 100 to one when you look at black families with children compared to white families with children. And clearly that is not sustainable. Two of the most important and effective ways to close the wealth gap is home ownership, which is still the primary asset on most Americans' uh, balance sheet, and business ownership, which while it doesn't close the gap fully, it shrinks it from 10 to 12 to 1 to 3 to 1. And so business ownership and home ownership is where we focus a lot of our attention. And again, you can see here where some of our, uh, some of the impact that we've had over the years, we've closed over 3,000 mortgages um, across our region, most of those to people of color. Um, you can see the percentage of people of color in the Deep South um, compared to our uh, mortgage lending, which in Mississippi, we did analysis last year of mortgage lending by banks and credit unions that report data to the federal government. And the um, in Mississippi, 17% of all mortgages went to black 
um, home buyers. This is in a state that's almost 40% black. And so we uh, are, are working hard to close that gap as well as to uh, ensure that women uh, have more access to uh, banking services. Um, women, black women are denied at twice the rate uh, for mortgages than white women in the, um, in, in, across the country. As I said, we started as a business loan fund. We continue to be very active in closing business loans. When you look at the U.S. government's primary program for closing uh, capital gaps for underserved businesses is the Small Business Administration's 7A Guarantee Loan Program. And, and less than 2%, um, I think it was 1.2% of all SBA loans in Arkansas went to entrepreneurs of color in a state that's 14 to 15% black. So we, 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 again, are very intentional about focusing our investments in underserved um, communities. You see that half of our loans go to entrepreneurs of color. Um, unfortunately, organizations like ours are, are, are rare and are shrinking. This slide shows where minority depository institutions, institutions owned by communities of color um, are, are a dying breed, um, particularly since the uh, Great uh, Recession. You see that uh, it was 120 in 2013 and 40 fewer um, when we last captured this data in 2018. And the assets are, uh, are much smaller um, we're all already smaller compared to non-Black institutions um, prior to the recession, and those assets have shrunk over the years. And so these vital institutions, what we like to consider as financial first responders in some of the most distressed communities, are shrinking and are, and are, and are going away. A few other data points. As I mentioned, a high percentage of our members did not have a banking relationship uh, prior to hope. And there's very few things that you can do to climb the economic ladder that at some point doesn't require financial tools. Um, we talk less and less about our mission in terms of providing financial services, but we talk about it in terms of opening opportunity um, in opportunity star places and financial resources are one of our primary tools for doing this. And so we capture, very intentional about capturing data, both to inform our work, but also to use in our advocacy efforts. Um, you know, again, we are, we, we know that the, the people in the region that we serve have less access to uh, financial tools. Almost 30% um, report, report having an income of our members less than $19,000 and any given day, the average in that they have an account of hope is less than $1,000. So these are very resource constrained uh, people. That is why even as we have grown, we know that by ourselves, we are dropping the bucket. So we are very active in advocating for additional resources to support communities like ours, not just in the deep South, but across the country. This is a, this slide depicts several other advocacy organizations, partners, others who care about these issues that we work with, particularly over the, since the onset of the pandemic to advocate for more investments in community development financial institutions, minority financial institutions to ensure that the federal resources that are being made available to get the economy and communities back on their feet don't miss those who need it most and to push back against some of the um, uh, some of the resistance to um, fair housing. Uh, when we started this work, we thought that some of the doctoring that supported uh, access, equal access to fair housing um, would uh, was settled. But we've seen in the past year and a half, uh, three of the largest banks in our region that have been uh, fined for redlining in the Memphis area. So um, 
these fights must continue and the data that we provide and the advocacy that it fuels is a critical part of, uh, of making sure that these issues don't go unaddressed. Another result of our advocacy program, as I mentioned, uh, was um, writing, making, writing loans to entrepreneurs during times of crisis. We did this after Hurricane Katrina um, when more resources that had never gone into the Deep South were going into the communities, but they were missing some of the hardest hit communities. Uh, we did it after the financial crisis when uh, its banks were closing in record numbers. I think 90% of all banks that closed um, over the decade following the uh, Great Recession were in low income census tracts. Um, we went from eight locations to 30 locations at, during that decade. So we ran to the fire to try to put it out. Uh, we also did this during the Paycheck Protection Program. In the This was the federal uh, program that was designed to provide recoverable grants, um, forgivable loans rather, to businesses that were closing as a result of the economic crisis um, that was spurred by the pandemic almost 40% of all black businesses closed uh, at that time. Uh, and, and these many of these businesses are small or small mom and pop businesses that while they may not be on the radar of the big banks, they are critical providers of jobs for in, in low income communities, particularly for people who may not have um, higher skills and higher education um, to help them acquire um, other um, uh, jobs that pay better wages and benefits. But they, they both provide employment, but also provide critical services in these opportunity starved communities. And so in a normal year, we do 550 uh, small business loans. Over the year from April 2020 to April 2021, we closed 5,000 paycheck protection loans. Most of those, the small mom and pop businesses, uh, very small loans. Um, and that was critically important to several of these communities. But as important was our advocacy to work with Congress, to work with the administration, uh, both the previous administration and continue with the Biden-Harris administration to advocate for supports for these sole proprietorships. And we were able to change the rules from the first round of the Paycheck Protection Loan Program to the second round when it was opened up and made available to organizations like HOPE and other community development lenders across the country. We also advocated, as I mentioned, for an increase in investments in these undercapitalized institutions. Um, in a normal year, the, the, the Community Development Financial Institution Program was started during the Clinton administration. And in a normal year, uh, the budget is around $200 million in grants and investments in these organizations. The demand is up to three to four times that in terms of requests for these funds. And so we advocated for, for Congress to significantly increase these investments. Um, this resulted in $12 billion in commitments to invest in community development banks, credit union, loan funds, venture funds, micro business funds. Uh, and, and that was, and that was uh, critically important. Data from our policy institute was included in the language that the House Financial Service uh, Committee passed and ultimately the House passed uh, and was included in the legislation that was ultimately passed by Congress and signed by President Trump in last December as a part of the CARES Act. It included in that 12 billion, 9 billion for equity investments in credit unions and banks. Um, in capital star regions like the one we serve, there's just not as much equity. Um, and, and, and across the country, Black banks are woefully undercapitalized relative to their peers. Well, for credit unions, um, the our regulator initially put forward rules that uh, limited credit unions' ability to get to take full advantage of the program. Banks were able to access these funds 
for at least 30 years or in perpetuity in some cases. And the an, an attorney at the National Credit Union Administration, which is the FDIC for credit unions, um, just um, put forth guidance that said credit unions could only get it for 15, have access to these funds for 15 years. Well, we, we, we provided data that show that two and a half million people would lose out and taken advantage of this program as a result of these rules. We, we pointed out that it was unfair to some of the most distressed communities, many of these communities of color, and it also was inconsistent with congressional intent. Um, in an incredibly uh, short time, NCUA changed their, their, based on our advocacy, pulling together other, other advocates of color who cared, and others who cared about these communities, and they turned uh, they, they turned around and they changed the rules and now credit unions were able to take full advantage of that. As a result, um, the last month, I uh, had the honor of attending what it was a watershed event in my nearly four decades of doing this work at the cash room in the Treasury Department during the Freeman's Bank Forum. It's properly named after the bank that one of the first black banks in the United States history, this last president, was Frederick Douglass. And during this, for, this forum, Secretary Yellen and Vice President Harris announced $8.7 billion in base investments in banks and credit unions across the country. Hope Credit Union was a recipient of $88 million, an, an award that we can leverage uh, 10 times. Every dollar of capital on a bank's balance sheet can be leveraged eight to 10 times. So that will get us to roughly another eight, between eight and 900 million dollars to invest in some of the most distressed communities in this country. It took us 14 years to grow from, um, from, from, from our startup to have 80 to 90 million dollars on our balance sheet. And in one day, the, the, we received a commitment of 88 million dollars from the federal government. That is a statement about the importance of of policy advocacy and shows what can be done when you take the voices from these communities and collectively advocate for the kinds of investments that can make a difference. In addition to public policy and advocacy, one of the things that I think sets our work apart from many other organizations like ours across the country is that we work very closely with the private sector to change their policies and practices. The image on the screen is uh, a, one of our first um, borrowers, one of our first depositors in Itabina, Mississippi, a small town in the Mississippi Delta where um, 1,500 people, Mississippi Valley State University is located, a, a very important historically black college in the heart of Mississippi Delta that educates leaders in that resource starred part of the country. But if you look at the demographics, it is you can get a sense of the distress that exists there. Um, not only the education and income and banking access um, um, outcomes, but the energy, uh, the power system um, grid of, of the community, the backup is a car battery um, that <laughs> indicates the kind of um, woeful investments in infrastructure that exist in these communities. Miss Miss Fanny Dotson here was one of our first depositors, and she made her first deposit ever in a federally insured depository with money she received on one, her 100th birthday in Hope Credit Union after we took over the bank branch that had it closed after the financial crisis. Um, so we are. Uh, we, 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 we partnered with one of the largest banks in the region to take that over. Instead of close it, we converted into a credit union branch, and we're now serving that community with the kind of tools that others take for granted. In addition to banks, um, we have worked hard to import capital into these communities. It's not exactly reparations, but it is repairing these communities. Um, when you look at Itabina, if we had we have had more than half of the deposits in that community, but if we had every deposit that was available, it would only be one and a quarter million dollars roughly. 
hardly enough to support jobs, businesses, education investments, uh, housing, um, and other infrastructure that is vital to a community's prosperity. And so what we've done is work to import capital in what we call transformational deposits. Um, Netflix last um, March um, reached out to us when they, uh, one of the um, leaders of Netflix had read The Color of Money and felt that it would be important for Netflix to use some of its cash holdings and deposit it in minority depositories. I knew some of the uh, people at Netflix, they knew the new hopes work, and we were the first to receive a deposit. It was a $10 million deposit that was at 10 basis points, and which is roughly what banks pay for checking and savings. Uh, and, but we were forced prior to the transformation of deposits to import capital in very um, expensive CDs and money markets that cost more and came from people looking for high rates um, because we didn't have access to the very low cost deposits in these communities. Netflix uh, lit a fire and before long we had deposits from PayPal, Thermo Fisher, Dick Sporting Goods, Everett Life Sciences, Nike has recently made a deposit, a $10 million deposit in our credit union. We've raised over $100 million over the past year in low cost deposits that allow us to finance, that we use to finance homes, businesses, alternatives to payday lenders in some of the most distressed communities across the country. Um, I'll end with um, uh, just a reference to the box at the top, uh, an effort that we call the Deep South Economic Mobility Collaborative. Uh, we partnered with nine, with seven cities, um, Birmingham, Montgomery in Alabama, New Orleans and Baton Rouge in Louisiana, Jackson, Mississippi, Memphis, Tennessee, and Little Rock, Arkansas, and historically black colleges and universities in each of those areas uh, to uh, initially identify some of those 5,000 entrepreneurs that needed paycheck protection loans that couldn't get it from their, um, from other banks. Goldman Sachs provided a, a credit facility that helped us to make those 5,000 uh, loans and plow $140 million into entrepreneurs to stabilize them and get them on the, help them get on the other side of the crisis. We continue, we're continuing those partnerships to now try to ensure that the trillion, of the trillions of dollars that are going into the economy, they don't widen the gaps as we saw after Hurricane Katrina and after the economic, uh, after the Great Recession. Often those investments go in the hands of, uh, of people who have always been at the front of the door, front of the line, and don't reach the hardest hit communities. With the resources that we've been able to secure from the federal government, with some of the partnerships that we now have in place, and the part, including partnerships with anchor institutions, HBCUs are often located in economically distressed communities. The cities that I mentioned have black mayors for the most part, and they all have a vested interest in making sure that their economies are able to benefit from the trillions of dollars that are coming in. And some of those resources go to support um, strengthening the water system here in Jackson, which is comparable to Flint, Michigan, uh, to supporting green development, affordable housing, and opening up doors of opportunity for communities that need it most. So I, you can take the um, PowerPoint down and um, I hope that gives you a sense of some of the things that are keeping us busy and some of the opportunities that are on the horizon. Thanks, Bill, so much for sharing your thoughts on uh, economic empowerment. And by describing in great detail the work being done within the HOPE organization, I, I uh, had no idea. I've watched a couple of your videos uh, and you know talks you've done in other organizations, but uh, I had no idea of all of the work that went on uh, to make sure that people are empowered and have opportunity for upward social mobility. Um, at this time, I'd like to encourage attendees to, again, to engage in the dialogue uh, in the live chat, um, uh, also on YouTube, or you can tweet your questions 
to hashtag policy talks. Um, we did receive a few questions and I'd like to start by asking um, the first question. So the first question is, what, in your opinion, what is at the root of stigmatic mistreatment against disenfranchised populations that keep such behaviors alive? That's a tough one. Um, I was actually a psych major, um, and I, it is still hard for me to get my arms around that. I, I think that there's a perception of limited resources and that it's a zero sum game. And some of the, um, some of my psych experience is, uh, and, and the demonstrations and lectures uh, suggested that when resources are scarce, people align with people who they um, can most relate to. And the, um, one of them, the first things that people relate to, and you can see, is skin color. And that's, uh, it's unfortunate because certainly people in Appalachia uh, and the black and, 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 and who are suffering from extraction in that region have more in common with people in the Mississippi Delta, black folks in Mississippi Delta and in the Alabama Black Belt than they do with white people in wealthy communities. And so there's, I think um, if we could get people to engage and vote in their own self-interest rather than from a position of fear and scarcity, I think we'd see very different outcomes. But that's, you know, there, there's so much um, of the narrative that pits people against each other and is, if you win, I lose. And I think that's not serving anyone well. And in a nation where that is becoming increasingly diverse, I think, you know, it, it probably perpetuates more anxiety. Um, and, and, and that is unfortunate. But I, I, uh, I, but I think some of those just, um, it's just, just un, unbased fear is, is, and that's perpetuated by some of the political narrative um, people trying to hold on to positions and power and resources, unfortunately, uh, fuel some of what we're seeing. As a follow-up to that question, uh, this this series really looks at discrimination and how it shows up uh, in institutions. And the next question is, how can legal advocacy, you talked quite a bit about advocacy, so how can legal, legal advocacy play a role in supporting economic and racial justice? It, it, it is it is critical. Uh, you noted earlier that I'm, I'm I'm fortunate to serve on the board of the NAAC Legal Defense Fund. Um, interestingly, I, I I was going to go to law school and try to be the next Thurgood Marshall or follow in his footsteps, but I got sidetracked by this economic um, uh, justice work, which has kept me busy. I haven't made it back to law school. Uh, yet, but uh, I, 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 serving on the Legal Defense Fund is important. One of the things that Thurgood Marshall emphasized in the creation of LDF was economic opportunity, um, not just legal. Um, when you need the when you need the courts to back you up, that's important. Um, and, and but I've also one reason I did not go back to law school is that I saw in the mid eighties, a lot of doctrine that again, I thought was settled being challenged by the courts mm -hmm. and felt that economic resources could be more durable and sustaining. Um, you, but you also have to fight on all fronts. One of the projects that, um, where that comes, plays out um, in our region is, is a housing development in the heart of Mississippi Delta in a community called Moorhead. Uh, when it's, it's one of the communities where we took over a bank branch that, was, that closed after the financial crisis. And I went to meet with the mayor and he asked me to get in his pickup truck and he drove me around the town and he took me literally on the other side of the tracks to a community that had been built in the seventies to bring the work workers out of the country, rural areas closer to the town so that they would be more, accessible to the plants and to the businesses, but it was intentionally built outside of the town limits so that the they could not vote in the municipal elections. Um, and so the mayor 
said that it was anything that we could do to help improving conditions in that community, which was an affordable housing development. It had been built in the 70s, um, uh, and the it was built with poor construction, poor wiring um, infrastructure. There was standing sewage in the streets, potholes, um, cracks in the sidewalks. And so we actually were able to work with Goldman Sachs and others to get some investment into that community, relatively small amount, and there were about uh, 50 to 60 homes there. Uh, we had charrettes with the residents, asked them what they wanted in the design. They, but the, um, back to the legal part, the, the um, developer of those, of that, uh, those homes was sued uh, because of the uh, poor construction and, and, the, and the fact that uh, people had been harmed. Actually, some uh, people had died in electrical fires as a result. And so they were sued and the properties were turned over to the residents, but now they own terrible properties and didn't have the resources to develop them. So when we were, we, when we were able to um, take over the branch and raise some resources, uh, we have now renovated those homes. But, but for the legal challenge, they would not own the home. Um, the, the University of Mississippi's Legal Law Center actually uh, led that lawsuit and was able to get the ball rolling to turn that community around. But it took the, it took a collective effort. Uh, you need to couple legal advocacy um, and uh, investment and other, um, you know, these communities need everything that anyone, any, any other communities need. And sometimes it takes, um, you know, takes legal advocacy to get it across the finish line. Bill, you talked earlier about how your organization has grown over time, uh, over I think four, maybe 14 years uh, to where it is today. So can you talk a little bit about strategically how you have continued to build your advocacy work in ways that have really led to the significant changes that you you talked about and you mentioned throughout your presentation? How can um, how you continue to build on that advocacy work and get the whole name out there? Well, it's actually been, we've been at this since 94, so about 27, going on 28 years now. The first, it took us 14 to get to 90 million, which yeah. we were able to get in one day, uh, and 80 million, 90, 90 million in one day um, recently because of advocacy. And the advocacy is fueled in a couple of ways. I think first and foremost is fueled by our policy team, which takes data from our members, from our experiences, and, 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 and uses that to get in front of um, public officials at the state, the local, and the federal level, um, been more effective at the federal level given the history of the political environment here in the Deep South. Um, but we take data and show what kind of return on investment can be realized now, what can be happening when you help people become homeowners, how it benefits everyone and not just some. And so we, we are very um, focused on bringing real world data to bear to policymakers, to businesses, um, to help inform and shape their practices. We uh, also have been fortunate to have the support of others who care about this work who are very influential. You know, I was hired by the board that hired me included the chairman of Walmart, uh, Sam Walton's son, uh, the head of the largest electric utility in this region, as well as a former governor and advocates who work in, in grassroots advocates who work in the Mississippi Delta. And so they brought their credibility to bear. They opened doors. They brought their peers um, to the table for conversations that I could not have had independently. Mm -hmm. And collectively, we've been able to convince people that these investments are in their best interest. There's a lot more to be done, but I do think that anchoring it in, in the realities of the communities has been critical to our success, as well as finding like-minded um, um, uh, allies who care about these issues. This, the next question uh, comes from uh, Twitter. 
And uh, Chelsea says that she's worked in local economic development during the first year of COVID-19 uh, and she helps small businesses access emergency capital. One challenge that minority owned businesses face was not having the business documents like the P&L, et cetera, needed to apply for uh, the PPP um, and also other funds. Was this an issue in your experience? Was this an issue? And how did you assist with that? It, it certainly has been an issue. It was an issue before PPP. And, and one of the things that um, confront us often is, is a business's ability to provide the data we need to make good decisions. And for the for the federal paycheck protection program, that not having documentation was not an option. And so we engage local business assistance organizations who were close to these communities and would roll their sleeves and hand, hold their hands to go back and collect the, the, the data. Um, you know, these businesses, you know, they they're not. You know, they're not lazy, they're not poor, they're not dumb, they just are resource constrained. And so when you're, you know, they, they do more with less than anyone that I know. Um, so they're incredibly entrepreneurial, but you have to prioritize where you put your time and resources. And so many of them are invisible and operate under the radar in our cash businesses. And so I had to take the time to help them pull the data together. And Fortunately, we, we've had advocates, I mean, uh, again, technical assistance partners mm -hmm. who did that. Um, we, we, we've never been under the illusion that what we do is all this needed. And so we have been very intentional about collaborating with others who provide other critical pieces of the puzzle. And together, we've been able to help businesses, help homeowners, help families uh, mm -hmm. get to a better position. So this next question um, comes from Eric Cleburne. So um, Eric mentions, you, you mentioned the importance of anchor institution. So what are some initiatives you would like to see colleges and universities pursue to promote economic empowerment and reduce the racial wealth gap? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's not just applicable for historically black colleges, um, but across institutions, you've got incredible um, expertise. You, you, um, you, we buy, we contract with, we have we're, we, all kinds of vendor and purchasing relationships. I think being intentional about um, making sure that that, that, business is, that that business, you do business with diverse entrepreneurs, with diverse suppliers and contractors. Uh, that is certainly, I think, low-hanging fruit. Um, you know, it is, you know, maybe you don't go to church or not in the country club, uh, live in the same neighborhood as these business owners, but so it may take a little extra effort, but there are businesses that are out there that can provide um, high-quality services and, and, and products and services. And if we're going to close these gaps, uh, I think we're going to have to be intentional about broadening the universe of our relationships and doing business with hiring um, 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 people who are um, understand these markets. I also think another thing that we can do is look at who are the decision makers in our institutions. Um, often the C-suites are not very diverse, racial or gender uh, wise. And, and I, 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 I'm, I'm Really glad Michigan is taking these issues seriously, but more institutions need to do that. And, uh, but then again, back to uh, work with HBCUs, when you look at the communities where they're located, they are going to need all sorts of investments. Uh, the infrastructure is often crumbling. Um, they need um, health care facilities. They need um, uh, service businesses, restaurants, um, you know, all the things that, again, communities that thrive have and that need capital. And so partnering with these institutions to identify um, some of the uh, investments that can move the needle on improving infrastructure. Often those are housing for faculty and student housing in these communities. So we're partnering 
on some of those initiatives. Um, but again, there, there's nothing that a thriving community needs that um, these underserved communities don't also need, but that lack the resources. But uh, I, think, I think these anchor, these institutions, these colleges particularly, are looked to not just for advice, um, but to also fuel the economy of the neighborhoods where they're located. And so we're being very intentional about trying to find ways to partner to, uh, to leverage their important positioning. Absolutely. So in our final uh, question, this question is from uh, Paige. Uh, so she wants to know, and I'm curious as well, what are HOPE's next goals for the near future? Are there any new programs, initiatives uh, that HOPE is planning to develop? You know, it's interesting. Um, we, we're, we're excited about the position that we find ourselves in. Um, we'll soon, you know, we started as a million and a half dollar loan fund um, um, with the uh, Enterprise Corporation, the, the credit union was a project in the church to try to provide an alternative to payday lending. And probably toward the end of this year, we'll have over a billion dollars in assets. Um, you know, small relative to need, but there's a lot that we can do with that. We want to go deeper in the communities that we serve. There's a lot unmet need and opportunity that I think we can help fuel um, we'll be looking to try to take advantage of technology. We, we're kind of a high touch um, um, entity, but we also need to be high tech. You know, we rely on data. We rely on um, you know, more people in communities of color have have smartphones compared to their non-white, um, their non-black peers. Um, but unfortunately, they don't have banking relationships. But that gives us an opportunity to serve people through um, virtually, through on, online and, and through their smartphones. And so we'll be looking to amp up our technological capabilities and go deeper um, that way, but also really ex expand our partnerships. We've got more HBCU per capita um, in this region than any other part of the country. There's a lot of faith-based organizations, nonprofits that are itching to help improve conditions in their communities. So I don't think there'll be a shortage of, of opportunities. It's, it's just a matter of um, how we prioritize and make the most of it. Well, that's um, all the time that we have to do. I'd like to first ask you, do you have any closing remarks? And then I'll uh, say something to close us out. No, I, I think I'm, as I said earlier, I'm really uh, thrilled to be part of the Ford School family. I've, I've, I've gained a great deal in my uh, class last year um, of learning and being inspired by the students. Um, I hope that um, we can um, import some of that energy and maybe we'll see a few Ford School alumni come to the Deep South and help us take this work to the next level. So again, just look forward to building on our relationship. Well. In closing, I'd like to thank you, uh, Bill, our faculty for being our faculty discussant, um, and also uh, you're a Towsley policymaker in residence. I thank you so much for talking with us today about economic empowerment and racial justice, and we are indeed fortunate to have you be part of the Ford School uh, family. I'd like to thank all of the attendees for joining us for today's event. The next installment of the Public Policy and Institutional Discrimination Discussion Series is February the 10th with Associate Professor of Public Policy, Ann Lynn. And the focus of this discussion will be on immigration reform and racial justice. So this end today, ends today's events. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you.